Welcome everyone to the Fifth Africa Regulatory Conference. Thank you for joining us for this second day of the conference. Yesterday, we reflected on how the regulatory ecosystem in Africa be strengthened, with a focus on the use of facilitated regulatory pathways and the progress in clinical research in the continent. Today, during this three-hour webinar with our esteemed speakers and panelists, we will, in a first session, do a deep dive on regulatory reliance. And this discussion will be followed by a second session focusing on ways to optimize regulatory frameworks for the management of post-approval changes to benefit patients. Before I hand over to my colleague, Angelica Yos, who would be moderating the track on reliance, allow me to remind you of these few housekeeping details. The Africa Regulatory Conference will be held in English with simultaneous interpretation services in French and Portuguese. You see on the bottom of the screen a little globe where you can easily change the language to actually accommodate your needs. All participants are being muted to ensure a good sound quality. So we really encourage you to use the Q&A toolbox also located at the bottom of your screen to raise any questions that you may have for our speakers and panelists today. Please note that there is an option to like vote for a question that was already posted, so we really would like to encourage you to use also this function. And as a final point, the full uh, conference is being recorded. All our presentations and videos will be made available on the Africa Regulatory Conference website following the conference. So you could also find on our website the bios and photos of all our speakers and panelists participating to the conference this week. I wish you all a good conference and fruitful discussions. And it's time now to launch our third track on Reliance. Over to you, Angelica. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody online. I'm very happy to welcome you to our Reliance session to kick off the day. Um, my name is Angelika Jos. I work for Regulatory Policy and MSD, and I'm also a member of the IFPMA Reliance Task Force. Um, we will have a very um, interesting discussion today, and I would like to start the day if you can move on with the slides uh, a little. So I have my slides there for a quick introduction what we will be talking today. Can you please move on the slides? Very well. So um, the importance of regulatory reliance, I think, um, is, is more and more understood because we have really challenges that are facing us with regarding to, on one side, the health status. We have a lot of underserved populations. There is a growing burden of uh, diseases. And uh, we really, um, can you put on the slide again in the presentation mode? One previous slide, please. So there's a raising burden of non-communicable diseases on the continents and on the world, and we have a growing burden of antimicrobial resistance as well. So the health status and the and is very clear. On the other hand, our resources are always limited. Um, there is a lot of high cost for innovative medicines. Um, there is a, a lack of innovation coming through, and there's also limited financial and structural and human capacity. So there's a balance that needs to be kept, and we need to um, ensure that we use the resources that we have to address the most pressing problems. And that's important that for all of us, because we want to ensure that we can achieve the sustainable development goals that have been set um, for 2030. So regulatory reliance actually is an important tool to help us with this because it can increase the efficient use of the resources and also avoid the duplication of the efforts. It can help us to accelerate access to safe and quality health technology and reduce some inequalities that are currently existing across countries and the continents. And so it reduces uncertainty for innovators if we have it structured very well and helps us also to improve convergence in regulations across the continents. Um, so overall, it is a very useful tool to promote more consistent and robust responses to a crisis, such as um, the COVID that we have seen. Next slide. 
Just a quick um, overview, uh, reliance is really present or could be used in all of our regulatory processes. It is not only useful for marketing and registration, uh, marketing authorization and registration, it's also very useful if you think about clinical trials oversight or clinical trial uh, application approvals, or um, if you look at the regulatory inspection phase, um, the uh, also licensing, establishing, lot release, laboratory testing, vigilance, marketing, surveillance, and control. So really you can use reliance tools in all of these different uh, regulatory activities um, and help focus the resources and achieve better outcomes. So with this short introduction, I would like to hand um, to the first speaker of the session. Um, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Marie Valentin who is the um, team lead for the facilitated product introduction department in the, in the regulation and pre-qualification department at WHO and an expert in regulatory reliance. So Marie, over to you. Thanks a lot, Angelica, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good day to you all. Um, thank you to the organizer, FPMA, and the partners to invite us to this very important uh, conference, uh, Africa Regulatory Conference. So as mentioned, my name is Marie Valentin, and I'm the team lead for the team facilitated product introduction in WHO headquarters. So this team deals with all the uh, rely uh, support the member states with all the reliance mechanism, the uh, collaboration procedure, and also all the joint assessment. So all the uh, models and mechanism to help uh, and to facilitate access and registration of medical products. Next slide, please. So 2023 is a very important year for WHO as we celebrate our 75th uh, anniversary. And it's been a, a long, interesting journey to support the member states in terms of building a regulatory system, but also to face uh, uh, pandemic and uh, outbreaks uh, in, in the recent years. And we can see that reliance has always played an important role in terms of building regulatory uh, systems and trying to use the resources as best as possible, but also for the responses from regulators to face emergencies. And we've seen it in the, in the responses to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, where reliance was a key uh, tool to try to uh, give access, uh, global access as, as swiftly as possible. Next slide, please. So um, if we look at the picture today, and I know you've had some uh, long discussion yesterday regarding the uh, building a regulatory system, uh, but if we look at the picture today, we know that out of the 194 member states, uh, a majority of member states, so 70% of the member states still have a regulatory system that are considered non-functioning according to international standards. So there's still a lot of efforts to be done in terms of building a regulatory system and making sure that they are uh, fit for purpose and they can oversight and control and monitor the medical product entering in the country. Um, so WHO has a, a program in terms of regulatory system strengthening, but we know it will take some time for some of the, uh, of the countries to build their system. So in the meantime, reliance is very important because we have to promote and help and facilitate access to quality medical products. So by using the evaluation and the inspection from others, we can help and we can uh, facilitate access to quality medical products. Next slide, please. If we look at the picture uh, on uh, the African continent, so this is the results from the global benchmark tool and the benchmarking uh, mission that are, that are conducted by uh, my colleagues from the regulatory system strengthening team at WHO. We can see that there are great progresses, uh, and it's very encouraging that uh, the maturity level is increasing. And we've got five countries currently in Africa with uh, that have reached maturity level three, which is great. So we've got two countries for uh, vaccine producing countries, so it's Egypt and South Africa, and three for uh, medicine and vaccine non producing country, which are Ghana, Nigeria, and Tanzania. So we can see that it, it's great to have a more a stronger regulatory system. And for those who are building their regulatory systems, it's very important in the meantime to look and to use uh, the higher maturity from others in terms of using uh, some of the output from these uh, regulatory authorities in terms of assessment, uh, clinical trial oversight or uh, inspection, or, uh, or other regulatory functions. So it's very important as we build the system to already use also uh, the, the good work that, uh, that is done in the region. Next slide, please. 
So the, the key concept of reliance, I think we are quite uh, familiar with it, but just to uh, explain again that um, we do not want to have one single voice of uh, uh, of the regulatory authorities. I think it's very important to have some independent uh, scientific review of application, and uh, it's always important to have uh, more than one voice. However, for some activities, uh, it's a risk-based approach. So does it make sense to uh, repeat an assessment? Does it make sense to repeat an inspection? And I think as regulators and, and regulatory community, we have to ask ourselves uh, where it makes sense, where there is a possibility to actually use uh, the evaluation that has already been done. There is um, a, a, a gradual um, uh, di diminishing uh, level of effort in terms of different model of reliance. So there is recognition, which is a more formalized way of reliance, where there is a uh, uh, recognition of the decision with limited uh, additional assessment, apart from the sameness of the product. We can all also use the assessment and do some additional local evaluation to see if it's uh, adaptable or if it's uh, adequate for own settings. There can be some work sharing or joint activities or the full assessment. And we can see that uh, the less we use reliance, the, the more effort and the more uh, duplication and workload we have. What is important to highlight here is that for any type of reliance, so there cannot be a successful reliance uh, procedure if we cannot ensure the sameness of the product. That is to say, we have to ensure that the product that is submitted to the reference authority is the same and the dossier that's supporting this product is the same as the one as the relying uh, that the relying authority is receiving. Next slide, please. So what are the good practices for reliance? One of the key aspects is transparency and access to the information, access to the assessment report, the inspection report, and any reports that support uh, regulatory uh, uh, functions. So transparency is one of the nine good regulatory practice uh, uh, concept uh, principle, and NRS are encouraged to conduct transparent regulatory operation and decision making. Uh, they are encouraged to publish uh, their, uh, their assessment report and explain what is behind uh, their decisions uh, to help others also in terms of, of reliance. So uh, NRAs that want to be uh, uh, want to act as reference agency, they are encouraged to issue public assessment report. We are also encouraging manufacturers to share this assessment report, and it is used a lot uh, in terms of application for uh, the. Um, the manufacturer to use assessment report to use uh, reliance with uh, the authorities. Um, in, in, if it's not available from the manufacturer, there's also a possibility with the uh, relevant agreements for NRS to share assessment re reports between themselves. Having the assessment report is one thing. Uh, we've noticed that if the NRS is actually part of the evaluation, so when we look at global health uh, registration procedures such as the European Union uh, Article 58 or EUM for all, Medicine for all, or the Swiss, meeting, me, Swiss Medic Marketing or, uh, um, sorry, Marketing for Global Health Products, we know that when we invite NRAs to be part of the scientific discussion, so they receive the dossier, they listen to the uh, scientific discussion, they also receive the question, they are asked to, uh, to comment, it's much more powerful because they really understand the decision process that was behind uh, the scientific decision to authorize a product, for example. Next slide, please. So what we're trying to do here is to make best use of available resources. So you know that we are changing uh, the concept of stringent regulatory authorities, and we are moving from this concept of stringent regulatory authorities that was linked to the membership of ICH pre-October 2015, to a more evidence-based and transparent system to define which are the authorities that can be uh, relied upon. So there is currently a transitional list of WHO listed authorities initiative, and we've put the link here. And we can expect actually to have the announcement of the WLAs, the first WLAs in, in the coming weeks or months. WHO pre-qualification as well is a great source uh, in terms of ensuring quality, safety, and efficacy of products. And both of these output, either from stringent regulatory authorities or pre-qualification, can be used uh, under the collaborative registration procedure, uh, because under this procedure, um, WHO facilitate access to the assessment report and inspection report, either from the SRAs or from pre-qualification, 
to allow for a, a facilitated decision at national level. When we look also at, uh, I've mentioned already the global health registration procedure, so the European Medicine for All or the Swiss Medical Marketing Authorization for Global Health Products, which are two procedures that are uh, very uh, uh, cooperative and including uh, target NRS in the decision to facilitate the, um, their uh, evaluation and also facilitate the assessments of the dossier at national level. Also, we have to look very closely as we are building the African Medicine Agency in terms of what type of model can be used in terms of either centralized assessments or joint assessments or any type of recognition that could be uh, done uh, on the continent. Next slide, please. So for, for the NRAs, it's for, there is unfortunately no one uh, size fits all. So it's for each NRA to really define uh, their strategy in terms of reliance and what do they need and what can be put in place. Um, so they have to look at the public health needs and priority of their countries. What is the level of resources and expertise available? What are the types and source of product evaluated? And also opportunities for reliance. So uh, is there a, a, neighbor, a neighboring regulatory authorities receiving the same type of products? Uh, could we use their assessment? Could we do joint assessment? Could we work together? So really for uh, NRS is to look at what could we do together? What uh, can I do I have to do alone in terms of regulatory authorities? And where can we work? Uh, where can I rely on external uh, evaluation or already regulatory, regulatory work to facilitate my uh, oversight of medical products? Next slide, please. So we've got some great example of reliance and work sharing on the continent. Um, the African Medicine Regulatory Harmonization Project has been very successful uh, in terms of harmonization of requirement, but also in terms of joint assessments in the different uh, regional economic community. And uh, for example, the, the Zazibona uh, procedure in, in SADAC has been very successful and they are celebrating their 10th uh, year anniversary this year. Uh, we can look also at, uh, in terms of clinical trials, and I know we discussed clinical trials yesterday, but in terms of clinical trials, the work, uh, the great work done by Avaref, uh, one of the technical committee of the IMRH, in terms of joint review of uh, uh, clinical trials, but also facilitate registration of key products, for example, uh, Ebola, COVID-19 vaccine, and more recently, the RTSS uh, malaria vaccine. Um, we can see that uh, it's a great example, even for other regions in terms of uh, for the clinical trials, to have a coordinated assessment between NRAs and ethic committees of the clinical trial application uh, coming to, to Africa. And then last but not least, uh, obviously, the the, as we build the African Medicine Agency, uh, and we know that there, there is some current discussion on the scope and the model for the centralized assessment and other facilitated pathways. So it's very important to look how to best uh, use the resources and what are the models that are uh, more efficient and make more sense uh, for the for the continent. And for this, I think um, some of the lessons learned from the from other uh, regional uh, regulatory reliance system, for example, the the European Medicine Agency, I think there are some lessons learned uh, to to take forward in terms of uh, processes and in terms of of, of model of of reliance. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. So as uh, mentioned by Angelica, the, it's very important to look at the full regulatory functions for reliance. And one of the important one is also batch release. Um, and I just wanted to highlight here the, the work of the WHO National Control Laboratory Network for Biologicals, which is a network that was created to facilitate uh, sharing of uh, quality and technical information for pre-qualified vaccines in terms of uh, trying to facilitate the batch release and to avoid duplication where possible. Uh, they, can, they played a key role uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in terms of uh, facilitating uh, the batch release for COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, we can see that um, many members are uh, from the African continent, and uh, we are hoping to, to increase also this, uh, this uh, number of members, but their, their role is key in terms of facilitating sharing of information and facilitate access to pre-qualified vaccine. And with that, I will move to my next slide. And I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any question and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Marie, for providing us the WHO perspective and also the tools the WHO has developed actually to help others, uh, agencies, um, to move forward on the reliance pathway and uh, on the assessments. Um, I would like now to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Isabel Coman pular who is uh, the head of the International Global Regulatory Affairs and Scientific Policy at Merck. Uh, Isabel is going uh, to tell us a bit more about how it works in practice and some lessons learned uh, from the industry perspective um, when doing reliance procedures. So Isabel, over to you. Thank you very much, Angelica. So thank you for the in invitation. So I'm uh, part of Merck, uh, Kagia, but uh, I'm also part of IFPMA. So, and I represent here the industry. Uh, so I represent the industry group uh, as part of IFPMA. So it's my great pleasure to be part of this session. Uh, we're working together with Angelica in the Reliance Task Force, and uh, we are keen to share a few examples of use of Reliance in Africa. Um, I will try to speak slowly so that uh, translation can occur in our French-speaking uh, countries. I can speak French, bonjour. But uh, today we will speak in, in English, but I, I try to speak slowly. So if, if you go to the next slide. So uh, this is a, a slide on uh, reliance on EMA as reference agency for a new marketing authorization application. This is a slide which is basically um, showing that reliance is not a new concept as mentioned by, by Marie. Uh, this has been used for a long time with the CPP and also afterwards with the COVID pandemic. I think there was a lot of importance around regulatory cooperation and information sharing. And this regulatory reliance has really spread amongst the world. Um, also, we know that uh, it can take various forms, so it can be applied to new mar marketing authorization application, life science, life cycle management, inspection, QC testing, batch release. Um, but here on this slide and, and in the course of this uh, session, we will mainly focus on new manufacturing authorization and also a little bit on life cycle. There will be also a dedicated session on life cycle. And these slides, uh, as I was mentioning, it's a slide that comes from a survey that we did uh, very uh, recently within uh, the European associations. Uh, it represents 42 uh, company responses, and it is part of a survey conducted as part of the EMA, so the European Medicine Agency focus group on reliance. And um, it was uh, um, conducted uh, earlier uh, this uh, this year, and it was uh, it is showing that EME is largely used as reference agency uh, for marketing authorization application, and that at least we can see that twenty six countries uh, are using EMEA as reference agency for initial marketing authorization application. At least because um, you see. As long as there was one feedback of use, you have a one. So the darker it is, the more responses we have. So the more reliance uh, pathway and, and reliance experience um, the, the industry has reported. So you can see, for example, in, in, in South Africa, Egypt. So if, if we move to the next slide, this is now going uh, to more specific case study. So this is one example of, of use uh, in, in my company. Basically, as a first example, um, it's a, a case study of reliance in Africa for new ma manufacturing authorization application. Uh, several manufacturing authorization application for small molecules and biotech. And it was done in the context of a, a backlog project. So it's a, it's a, a project from the health authority uh, to uh, recover uh, for a, a backlog of registration dossier. So it's in a, in a specific uh, scope. So um, the key success factors for this reliance application were that the dossier was identical to the one that was filed in the reference 
um, countries, so the same as the original dossier, except for module one. There was also a declaration of sameness provided. And as it was part of a specific backlog project, the health authorities were sufficiently resourced uh, to uh, focus uh, their capacity on this uh, project. In terms of dossier content, it was quite extensive. You can see on the screen on the orange uh, light box, all the documents that were required in addition to the CTD dossier. So the CTD dossier as identical to the reference dossier. But at the time, uh, there were um, alongside other additional documents that were uh, requested. And you can see the list here uh, especially if was the unredacted assessment report, sameness declaration, uh, a reliance document comparing reference dossier to the original dossier, risk management plan, uh, and other very uh, specific documents. So if we move to the next slide, uh, similarly, we also, uh, in the same country, uh, use reliance for life cycle. Uh, for some uh, variation, both for a CMC change uh, and also for labeling safety update. It was also part of a, a backlog uh, project. Um, and you can see that uh, the file was uh, uh, a bit uh, restrict, uh, simpler, I would say, with um, uh, a little bit less additional documents. Um, and then if we move uh, to the next slide, I think this is really the lessons learned, I would say. So I think that this is uh, a great, great uh, possibility because the main benefits of the use of reliance were really the streamlining of approval timelines, first of uh, hopefully access to patients afterwards, because if the approval is accelerated, uh, the access uh, is also uh, should be uh, indirectly. And, and you can see that uh, comparing uh, at the time, standard timelines compared to those reliance timelines, it kind of 50% less. Um, uh, so it was quite a huge, uh, a huge acceleration and a, a, a very um, nice uh, lift of, of the of the backlog uh, of both variation and, and new applications. So new products that were registered already in, in Europe um, and, and that could be uh, then further registered in Africa as a uh, very important um, uh, medicines. So, and even life-saving medicines. So uh, the watchouts, I would say, or let's say in order to ensure the sustainability of, of the reliance, um, because again, this was in a specific backlog project, but in order to ensure sustainability uh, outside of the, the specific scope of this project, uh, maybe we could also recommend some enhancements uh, related to the true application of reliance. I would say when I'm saying true application, it means maybe to balance the need for additional documents um, with the the real um, scientific evidence need uh, and and to to uh, to um, yes no, not to overburden maybe uh, somehow the, the the system and to use a risk based approach of the necessary additional requirements um, and also maybe to we also experienced during the life cycle for safety. I think this is very important that we could use, very beneficial that we could use Reliance for life cycle, especially for safety variations, where it is really important for the patient to have the latest PI with the latest safety information. Um, this is critical. Um, um, in, in that, we experienced also the, a lot of, uh, of reviews on the PI with uh, changes, what I mean is that they not they they may also have requested some change to other section of the PI that was that were not uh, impacted by the change. That's what it's mean. But all in all, I think a great a great experience um, with maybe uh, if more reference regulatory authorities 
um, our, our agreements are in place with with more in the future even a recognition review so with uh, what I call the full full reliance or reco re recognition this is the exact WHO terminology that would be put in place so I think great experience great practices uh, that can be leveraged and then um, some um, fine tuning with regard to um, the implementation and then the second case is not uh, is from my Pfizer colleagues so if you move to the next slide thanks you can she kindly uh, shared also our experience in a different country with also uh, for new marketing authorization in the case it was a pilot so the situation if I can briefly summarize that uh, there was also a, a backlog of application and the authority could not longer meet their targets. So they stopped to, to review the application for new products. And there was then this pilot initiated for use of Reliance for uh, to, to start to, 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 to use it. And um, then the, the, therefore there the was, uh, and, and for sure this, it was to avoid also to have these considerable delays for patients in having new innovative products. And I think that Pfizer initiated an early dialogue with the National Regulatory Authority to propose a new approach, to discuss the application of this um, new reliance pathway that was not formal at the time. And they resubmitted the, their, their dossier um, with a, a supportive assessment report from EMA. And you can see on the slide also the documentation that were requested in addition to the full CTD. Um, that are listed there with the eight uh, bullet points. So if you if you move to the to the next slide, I think that similarly as in our case, uh, it was a, a tremendous acceleration in terms of approval because it was in less than three months versus the standard pathway up to two years. And it also paved the way for this pilot for, for use also for other companies as a new possible uh, process. Um, I think that uh, one of the recommendation, uh, so one of the key success factor was the dialogue with the local trade association, the dialogue with health authority to give also input on the guidance as working progress. And in terms of recommendation, I think that um, again, the. Uh, the request for some specific documents uh, may create additional bottlenecks, uh, which would prevent then to fully leverage the full benefit of Reliance Pathways. So, for example, the use of legalized CPP, the use of QIS, if it has to be signed by a stringent regulatory authority. Um, and, and then... Uh, to enhance, uh, to, to continue to benefit uh, uh, of the reliance. I think that is, it's the importance of training, of capacity building to upskill um, all, all committed into this, uh, the use of this, this pathway from our local industry, a regulatory affair team, uh, to all departments also, um, and, and all departments at, at the national regulatory authorities in order to also ensure uh, sustainability of, of the use of reliance, depending also on the on the priority of needs, depending on the capacity uh, and resource uh, available. So I think that was it for the case studies. So if we move to the next slides with regard to general lessons learned from these an the analysis of this case and also from other cases that we have shared in many conferences, uh, from our IFPMA member companies, we have outlined a few lessons learned for us um, and uh, open for, for, for discussion. First, we really uh, contend that the future WHO uh, listed authorities um, will replace the traditional list of stringent regulatory authorities, and there will be a, a much more diversity in the reference authorities that can be used and um, that with some particular scope of designation. So I think this is moving forward, uh, um, uh, giving us a, a lot of new opportunities. Then uh, registration testing, I think that Marie showed for, for batch release, 
for registration testing, um, I think it also is a, a step uh, for reliance if mandated that can slow down the registration process. So I think that reliance is, can be also applied for registration or batch testing with a national competent laboratory, with a reference re regulatory authority testing, or with a certificate of, of analysis from the manufacturer when regularly inspected. And then for sure, in those case studies, we, we extended also the, the use of the, of the reliance for full life cycle. So we use it for MA, new marketing authorization application, but also post-approval changes can be used also in QC testing, as I mentioned, clinical trial with AVAREF that uh, Marie also showed in the screen. Uh, that is really very, very um, also um, helpful uh, for harmonization of requirements and for having a, a joint uh, assessment done. And then uh, a, a few other points like having confidentiality agreement, memorandum of understanding. This takes time because this is legal, but this helps also to cover confidentiality and to give access to unredacted assessment reports. To also have fine to share final lists of questions, and to leverage the full reliance, so uh, to um, avoid to have uh, to use uh, additional documents when not really needed based on the risk-based approach. So I don't know if I have still some time I'm, I'm, uh, or not, but I have two I think uh, slides uh, to go more. But uh, if I have a chance to go in, on the second uh, on the next slide. Yes, on the next slide, you can see also same survey that's conducted by uh, European Association when using EMAS reference authorities. You can see um, a list of documents that were uh, most frequently quoted as used to apply reliance with some documents that may be redundant uh, in between them. We, we spoke about uh, uh, for example, for sure, ECPP approval letter are, of course, uh, needed, uh, as always, for, for reliance. European public assessment reports are available and contain all the relevant information, but maybe others might be a little bit redundant uh, and can well, the information could be fine in, in the dossier, uh, like for the QIS, um, which is a very specific document uh, that maybe you can also find the same information in, in module two. But this is, a, again, uh, open for, for further uh, panel discussion. And then on the last slides to conclude, I think that reliance is extremely helpful. It was extremely helpful in all the case studies and all the exchange that we have had. Uh, it avoids duplication of work for us, for, for regulators, provide opportunity to address capability gaps and, and for sure, have earlier approval and access for innovative products. Um, and when ap applied with uh, to extend it to life cycle, it can be um, very, very helpful. I, I um, show a case uh, for, for uh, the first country and also for, for clinical trial applications. So thank you very much for your, your attention. Um, and I want to uh, thank uh, my colleague, uh, Charlene Rupnarin from Merck and Trisha Patel from Pfizer and all the IFPME Reliance Task Force members for helping to set up this uh, discussion today and this slide set. Thank you very much, Isabel, for providing us more insights into the practical application, basically, of reliance with the specific case studies. I find that's always very interesting to share. And it's clear that uh, reliance is a uh, a tool to um, be more efficient with the resources, not only for regulators, but of course also for industry, because industry of course struggles with resources as well. It's uh, resources are scarce everywhere. And so I think it's very important that you show that to, to everyone. Thank you very much. Um, we are now going to um, switch over um, to the panelists. Um, I'm delighted that we are joined today by three regulators from Africa. Um, first, we will have uh, Dr. Anthony Houghton, who is providing us an insight, um, who, is, who is the Assistant Director and the GBT Coordinator of uh, NAFDAQ in Nigeria, and who is basically uh, giving us some insights from, from his perspective. Then um, we will hear from Egypt. Um, Dr. Hebetela Ibrahim is with us. She's the Head of the Marketing Ad Authorization Administration 
for the biological products at the Egyptian Drug Authority. So very welcome, Dr. Ibrahim. Um, and last but not least, we will also hear some perspective from Algeria. Um, Ms. Bougera Khadija is with us. She is the quality management officer at the National Agency for Pharmaceutical Products in Algeria. And Dr. Um, Khadija will be speaking in French, just to announce it already now. So um, audience, English speaking audience should please switch then to the interpretation uh, channel so you can follow, follow the intervention. So with this short introduction, um, I will just um, give the floor to Dr. Anthony Houghton um, to uh, explain to us, you know, how are you, Dr. Houghton, how are you um, implementing uh, reliance in Nigeria? And uh, could you give us also some practical example of how it really works from your perspective? Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be in this panel and also to, the participants for this great opportunity for us to meet again to interact. I will be speaking from the experience of global benchmarking, our ML3 experience, and how Reliance really impacted to us positively. Uh, suffice to say that the W2GBT program is a game changer to us, a unifier, and also a catalyst in promoting system strengthening. The tool itself is designed among other elements to encapsulate reliance as a sub indicator that cut across all the nine regulatory functions. You cannot get to ML3 without doing reliance. In June, 2019, we have a formal benchmarking of WHO and the result reveals five basic factors that turn us around. One of them, Number one is huge routine sample collections from the port of entry, GMP inspections, post-marketing surveillance sampling, and renewal registration sampling. The second factor that was observed during the benchmarking was enormous lab testing. About 17,000 samples were analyzed in 2018, with many unanalyzed, which also affected the approval process because the timeline of issuance of lab reports have been delayed by this huge sampling. The third factor that was observed also that 6,000 backlogs of applications were awaiting approval as a result of one, no lab results, also GMP, that's also delayed. The fourth factor was the re-registration with a full review of all products which resulted in delays in approval because we do all reviews even for renewers at that period. Then was we also observe a non-application of risk-based approach in our system. Then the solution provider came by GBT, uh, W2GBT IDPs. Now we leverage the GBT, uh, the GBT concept enable the agency on its own to leverage on the concept of reliance, which is embedded and aided by the risk-based approach that we have. That helped us, we developed a structured and published legal provisions, regulations, policy, guidelines, procedures, templates, and checklists with clear review pathways to help uh, our stakeholders on relays across all regulatory functions. The second factor also, the second point is we developed an overhiking risk-based procedure and which was rooted in the compliance risk characterization, that is the violation profile, and also the intrinsic risk characterization that's top of the product type, its origin. Is it coming from an SRE for us to read out from WHOPQ? So based on those two, the implementation of these procedures now was made evidence to give us this result, which I read, well, which I will explain now. I think there are about five or six of them. Number one, the huge sampling we have 48% significant reduction of product sample for laboratory analysis was as stiff as, a, as against the among us 17,000 samples that we sampled in 2018. Okay, the clearing of the 6,000 backlogs of application for registration for approval was also achieved because of the application of the rigs base. Then reduction of approval timeline from 120 days for a normal application to 60 days on reliance pathways. 
it help us also to judiciously utilize uh, the utilization of our scarce resources and also in the reliance component also serve as a capacity building component for regulators for us because when we rely on some inspections and also see the pathways uh, reporting it also helps to streamline our system now some of the reliance pathways that we use was WHO CRP, SRA CRP, Swiss Medics. At the uh, regional level, we have WAHU Joint Review. And also at the continental level, we use AVAREF Joint Review. The AVAREF for clinical trials really was a turnaround to us. The clinical trial team has participated in several joint reviews and benefited us from the short time turnaround uh, before, during, and after pandemic. And this has helped us not to reinvent the wheel, but also to maximize regulatory time to other critical areas and application. Of course, with all these huge successes, we gone into ML3 and it gave us better results. Of course, we have challenges. What are these challenges? Let me just mention a few from the Reliance component. Some applicants submit dossiers that are not the updated version, maybe from the bleacher sites, when they issue the application and it was reviewed, we see this, you will not review, submit the former one. Some SRAs do not supply the applicant with unredacted assessment and inspection report. It becomes more difficult when we don't have MOU to last, we start NRA to give us the unredacted assessment reports. Then lack of availability of endorsed quality inspection summary. It's another factor that is challenging from some of the SRAs for Reliance. And most applicants also don't read and understand the pathways of submission in our guidelines on our website, resulting to backlog for submission way to and fro. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you agree with me because of the timing that we don't want to exhaust us. I come to the end of this. I appreciate you all. Thank you very much for sharing the Nigerian perspective and congratulations. This is really um, a very interesting um, an, a, a experience from agency that fully embraced reliance in all these, um, in all the procedures. You highlighted the inspection that is very uh, important as well as sample testing, uh, very interesting uh, perspective. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Um, let us hear now what uh, Egypt has been done in uh, recently in the biologics specific sector, um, Dr. Ibrahim. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be with you today. Uh, actually, we are exper uh, experienced uh, Reliance since 2015, because we start uh, Reliance by waiving an inspection uh, to manufacturing facility for the product that is imported from a reference country, which is a list of 22 countries we uh, are relying on uh, for an inspection. Uh, after, uh, and also for the pre-qualified products. We don't perform uh, an inspection to the manufacturing facility. Uh, then in 2018, we had uh, recognized the uh, assessment of M and FDA for uh, uh, the marketing authorization of imported products. And according to this recognition, uh, there was a ministerial decree uh, 820 that was uh, issued. And according to this ministerial decree, we had registered more than 137 pharmaceutical products and 47 uh, biological products. And actually after a visit from the WHO in 2020, uh, we decided to draft a guideline for Reliance. This draft was started in uh, 2021 with a pilot phase extended for eight months with uh, three products uh, submitted in this uh, pilot phase. Uh, after that, we had issued a reliance guideline for biological product in July 2022. And this reliance guideline have two level of uh, marketing for marketing authorization. At the two level, level one uh, that grants the marketing authorization license uh, after one month from the submission of the file and level two after two months. Uh, we asked the applicant to submit an addition to the complete CTD file that had been submitted to uh, EMA and FDA uh, uh, as a complete unreducted assessment report uh, and or the list of questions raised from the regulatory authority in addition to the sameness letter and the complete CTD file except for module one, which is a reasonable one. 
uh, and according to this guideline, we had registered uh, 25 products uh, through uh, level one and six biological products through level two. And we have now 25 products under registration. And for the pharmaceutical product, uh, they was following uh, the 820 ministerial decrees that I had mentioned before. And they had recently in uh, July 2023, they had issued a reliance guideline. And now, now they have uh, products under registration according to uh, this guideline. We also extend the level of reliance to cover uh, more function other than marketing authorization through issuance of uh, lot release policy and guideline in 2022, which depend on recognition of uh, other stringent regulatory authority for both uh, lab testing and lot release function. And actually, according to, uh, after application of the Reliance uh, pathway for uh, registration, we save uh, the effort for uh, complete assessment to our locally produced product which need more effort from us to uh, to do. And uh, we have the willing to include more uh, regulatory authorities and M and FDA in the upcoming years to, to be uh, relied on according to uh, our guideline. Uh, this is our practice. And uh, actually from the 21 uh, products registered, we cover uh, a different category of products. We have plasma drive products, vaccine and monoclonal antibody. So we had the experience uh, to uh, place a product in the market after just one month from the submission of the file. And this is all for the sake of the patients. And as we all, uh, we are all patients, whether we are the regulator or uh, the industry, we are all patients. So it's all for uh, the sake of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. That is well said. We are all the same. We are all patients. That's true. We all do it for the benefit of patients. Thank you very much. Um, and it's interesting to hear from you that Egypt is now basically expanding the experience from the initial marketing organization also to post-approval changes in other areas. Um, to really benefit more from uh, reliance efficiencies. And thank you also for highlighting the that it's important to have harmonized dossiers basically as much as possible, because that facilitates, of course, submissions and assessments, um, also from a global, uh, I would say, company perspective as well. Thank you very much. Um, and then I would like to give the floor now to Dr. Uh, Khadija. Um, please, uh, audience, you can switch your channels in the interpretation. Please choose uh, English translation. Thank you. Floor is yours, Dr. Khadija. Merci, Dr. Angelica. Uh, thank you, Dr. Angelica. I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this uh, uh, meeting. It's an honor for us to participate uh, in this meeting and share our exper uh, experience and, and share a topic uh, that we are all interested in, in the pharmaceutical industry. And before I go in the depth of the topic, uh, I would like to present our authority of regulation, which is the National Agency of a Pharmaceutical Products. It's a public establishment that has been created by the, the law uh, 1811, and uh, it's under the Ministry of uh, Ministry of uh, Industry and Pharmaceutical Production. Uh, the, the responsibility is to the register, registration of pharmaceutical uh, product uh, and also to giving authorization after registering the product. It's also in charge of the organization of uh, medical uh, product. Uh, and it's also responsible of the control and expertise of pharmaceutical product and uh, the this medical uh, uh, equipment. The concept of recognition in Algeria is applied in the process of registration and for certain medication uh, that are uh, medicine that are used in some uh, agency, uh, sanitary health agency. And the, the, the framework of the applica application exists, uh, we have the decree uh, to 23, 20 of uh, 22 November uh, 2020 that uh, uh, stipulate uh, how to register uh, pharmaceutical medicine and Article 32 that says that the uh, National Agency of Pharmaceutical Product can give the decision of registration uh, on the basis of an evaluation of uh, uh, 
uh, and this evaluation can be based on the conclusion uh, given by the authority, uh, regulatory authorities or authorities that uh, have a convention of recognition with the National uh, Agency of Pharmaceutical Products. For that, we have adopted a procedure of evalu evaluation uh, to set up this concept. The procedure uh, of evaluation uh, uh, say that the list of uh, medications are is fixed by a ministerial decree, uh, the, uh, the decree 2020. So, which can be uh, based uh, on the uh, report of uh, uh, evaluation of uh, the authorities that are recognized by the country. This evaluation uh, is, a, is a partial evaluation of a pharmaceutical file. And, the, and all the data that link to the uh, prescription, we also have the data that are linked to uh, the use of the substance and fin finished products, uh, data related to security and efficiency of the test of, of generic product and uh, uh, therapeutic product. This report uh, is uh, done by our expert uh, evaluator a service of the National Agency of Automatical uh, Product, and we submit this report with, to a commission of registration before uh, giving any decision of registration, and also the committee of uh, experts that will give their uh, point of view. But this disposition does not uh, exonerate uh, uh, that you need to uh, uh, submit a complete file and to justify that the product uh, is registered and and traded uh, uh, or those that are recognized recognized by the national agency of uh, pharmaceutical products the article 5 of uh, the uh, law of the 26 december 2020 and the by the dg uh, we can find it on the website of the ministry and on the uh, social network as well. So in general, because in Africa, the recognition is through the evaluations of uh, pharmaceutical product and uh, the, the use of the right of registration uh, facilitate the process of registration and, and making sure that the security, the efficiency of the product that has, are traded and registered in our national territory and without, uh, with uh, 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 taking account the sovereignty on our regulation, this also gives the opportunity of to all the uh, stakeholders of the regulation authority with the industry and give the easy access to the medicine and uh, enable also to avoid the duplication of the efforts and to reinforce uh, the regulatory system and also uh, to the industry, uh, uh, giving them a easy uh, approbation uh, for uh, their product. And to conclude, uh, the, in Africa, uh, a, maturi, a regulatory uh, uh, framework uh, uh, necessitate a collaboration uh, of all the regulatory auto authority and our objective is to make sure that we have equitable access to uh, pharmaceutical products. And, and I would like to thank you once more for inviting me and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Merci, for giving us the perspective of the Algerian agency. Um, you, you, are, uh, you have implemented a lot in the recent years, so a lot of progress has been made. Um, timelines have been shortened, I assume, as well in this part of the process. So um, I think we are now uh, opening it up, actually, to everyone, the, uh, the whole session speakers. Please, if you would come on, on your cameras. Um, we want to have more conversations with the audience, and I'm encouraging everyone um, to put on more in the Q&A. You can use the Q&A function um, to send us any questions um, that you want to have for uh, answered or you want to have from our panelists. Um, and uh, let's see what we got in. Uh, you can also like questions if you uh, have the same question as is already displayed, uh, displayed and has come in from the screen. 
um, and we can go and see uh, what what is uh, on your minds. So please uh, send in questions. Um, we will have here one comment actually, um, and that is uh, that uh, a comment that we should be referring to marketing authorization holders rather than manufacturers um, because the, the, there may be confusion um, because manufacturing authorization holders are always the manufacturers. Um, so frequently certain multinational companies, um, they not make use of contract manufacturers and so on. So I think that's a good point. Um, we really need to make the distinction between uh, manufacturers and marketing authorization holders. And what we are talking about, sometimes there's confusion when we are um, when we are not clear about wording. Is anyone want to comment on that perspective? I can, uh, sorry, I, I can't see how to raise yes. my hand, but a quick one. Yes, I think, uh, thanks a lot for the question. So uh, before working, uh, I joined WHO in May 2019, before I was in the European system at the European Medicine Agency. I think the way that the, the terminology is often linked to some of the legal framework. So in the marketing authorization holder is typically a, a, a term that is used uh, under the European legislation. However, for global uh, on global perspective, what uh, uh, usually what we refer to, and uh, I understand that it can be a shortcut because it doesn't always, uh, the one that holds the marketing authorization or the registration is not always the manufacturer, but in a global sense of term, so for the global use, uh, usually we use manufacturer. So because the, the, the term is different in different region and, and legal frameworks. So um, that's why uh, for global use, usually uh, they refer to manufacturer. Okay, I understand. Maybe we need to have a glossary, you know, to um, for all these terms so that people understand um, the same thing when we're talking about these things together. Very good. Uh, good suggestion. Um, there's also a comment here that um, for the, I think that was for you, Isabel, that was on the survey uh, slide mm -hmm. that uh, 26 countries were using EMA as a reference agency. Um, shall the same be reflected in Europe once the AMA fully comes into effect? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I want to highlight also, because maybe it was not clear in the slide, that uh, the 26 countries minimum is using EMA as a reference agency in the context of unilateral reliance. So a specific pathway for uh, using EMA as reference agency, not an uh, WHO uh, collaborative pathway like uh, Dr. Houghton mentioned, like SRA, CRP, or, uh, or other pathway, because EMA is also very uh, much used in the SRA CRP. So I want to highlight that this slide reflects the use in case of unilateral reliance, like what was uh, the, the case also uh, in Algeria uh, that was uh, talked about uh, by uh, the representative today. So should this be reflected in Europe once AMA fully comes into effect? I think that there is a lot of exchange now in between Europe uh, and and uh, Odanipad in the building up of the Africa Medicine Agency, a lot of of uh, um, uh, capacity building, a, a lot of exchange in uh, concerning the the processes and the governance, and I think this is good that uh, this can cross fertilize. Um, this is good also, but I think that as you rightly mentioned, I think that AMA is also um, something to be built so it's like a new world <laughs> it's it's like when you have to write a page blanche or <laughs> white paper like for authoring a new page so it gives a lot of possibilities including uh, a further um further exchange and further collaboration with ema for sure so how uh, this i cannot uh, tell now because this is still to be written but I'm sure that uh, there will be more more collaboration in the future and uh, in in between uh, IMA and and uh, and AMA. I don't know if if Marie wants to comment uh, more. We don't have an IMA representative uh, today. 
No, no, I think I fully agree with you. I think it's a very exciting times because we, the, the, as the system is being built, but as I mentioned in my presentation, I think it will be very interesting to, we're not starting from scratch. We've got some uh, original reliance mechanism, either uh, you know supported by uh, legal framework or not, because we've got other uh, regions as well where there's uh, like a recommendation. I'm thinking of CARICOM, for example, in the Caribbean, where there's a recommendation for a set of, for the countries that if they want to use it. So, I think it's it's uh, it will be interesting to see how the model will be built, but we should build from experience and we should build uh, by sharing experience. And it's definitely what is happening. And as we mentioned, Isabel, the, the EMA is working very closely uh, with the establishments of the AMA, the African Medicine Agency. Right, and ab absolutely, as I understand Reliance, you know, it's for every agency in the world. So everyone should basically make the best use of the resources. So whatever way you can learn from and what you can share, um, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Okay. Um, I think I, I want to just add also that for Naima, we know that they have several uh, Reliance, also EUM for all. Open also is also an, uh, another I think mm -hmm. uh, yeah. aspect for info sharing. So that there are already some pathways uh, available uh, with some collaboration with uh, other countries which are opening uh, UM for a little bit uh, older, but open is quite new. Uh, so we look also forward for some, maybe some some other more yeah. countries to join. Uh, open. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for highlighting that, Isabel. Um, I have here a question for Dr. Bouguera. The abbreviated procedure is applied to imported products registered in Europe. If so, how? Did you understand the question? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I would like to know the products that are uh, shared by, we have medication that are uh, uh, shared for or scarce uh, diseases and uh, some uh, medication are shared for a different treatment and uh, the medication that are in the national plan, we also have a neurological medications such as uh, vaccines, some of the vaccines and pharmaceutical and antidotes. And all this medication can be applied, can apply this uh, process of assessment. I hope I have answered to your question. Thank you very much. Um, we have also here a question to, I think that's for WHO, um, that was rated very high, eight likes. Uh, while Reliance is a great option for increasing patient access to needed healthcare products, is WHO doing capacity building in the um, authority levels to ensure the seamless execution of the pathways? Um, is there training specifically for NRA staff to uh, be ready for those applications? Is, is there a WHO um, activity, Marie? Yes, so um, thanks a lot for the question. Definitely, so WHO, has, uh, I think uh, there is a, a different level of uh, um, uh, uh, action. Uh, so there are three levels of action. One is regarding obviously the, the, the standard and the, uh, the text, the guidelines. So as you know, the, 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 good, the WHO Good Reliance Practice was uh, published a couple of years ago. And we are looking also, we've released a, a e learning course, like a short e learning course on good reliance that can be taken and is free, that can be used. I will put it in the chat for everybody, but it can, it's available in English, in French, and in Portuguese. And it can uh, be, uh, uh, it's uh, free, so it can be uh, shared as uh, widely as possible. So this is one thing in terms of uh, publishing guidelines and recommendation. Um, our colleagues from uh, uh, NAFTAC, uh, uh, Dr. Anthony mentioned that uh, there is also, it's very integrated in the global benchmarking tool. So all, all, when we go and help country and uh, uh, to build their regulatory system, in terms of the global benchmarking tool, many of the indicators, either for the national regulatory system, but also for a lot of function marketing authorization, clinical trial inspection, there is uh, uh, indicators regarding reliance. And also that we work together to build an institutional development plan. So this is the roadmap to look at what is the maturity level currently, 
and how can you reach your maturity level? So to have a roadmap of what do you need to do? And so we help them also to define uh, what Reliance model and learning from experience because learning from other countries and uh, other models uh, that can be used. And then on a specific procedure, <clears throat> either collaborative registration procedure, as you know that, so there is the WHO collaborative registration procedure, which is an example of alliance uh, with uh, signing the agreement with the, the, uh, the countries, but helping them to uh, to uh, to use this assessment report and inspection report. But there is also the EM for all, or the CPP, there are a lot of different reliance mechanisms. So I would say that at, at three levels, the system strengthening, the guidance, and also the implementation in terms of uh, processes. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Is there any other perspective? Um, I also wonder if national regulatory authorities are providing training to their staff. I, I don't know, Dr. Anthony, you, you highlighted that there was a lot of SOPs and procedures and regulations also for internal staff. Do you provide training as well? Yes, of course, for a procedure or a regulation to be effective, training must be instituted first when it's approved every staff internally must be trained to know how to use that same procedure in order to give us a good turnaround time. So without the implementation, of course, it is rooted through the concept of QMS, the quality management system that gave room for processes to be developed and also training should also be part of it. Thank you. There is a quick, there is a question. I don't know, maybe I'm jumping the gun. I think I saw a question targeted to, to me that's what were we doing well and what we didn't do well and for us to exploit ML1 to get out of it. I, I think I enumerated at first, I think Maria will agree with me because I know they are one of the assessors. At first, when that visit came, we were thinking we are, we are good, but the GBT to extract it to the level that we saw that we needed to do more. I rightly stated by Maria to the, the nine regulatory function, each of the function has a sub indicator that talks about reliance. For reference, the regulatory system as it were, the reliance component there is maturity level two. So if you can't get reliance at that level, no matter how good you are, you still remember maturity level two. If you can't make maturity level two, you're in maturity level one. That's how the system is designed. So you have to, but the first building block for the GBT element, as one of the pre presenters said about transparency, is legal provisions. So that legal provisions has to be instituted first on how to carry out reliance, regulation, guidelines, procedures, policies, so that you can come on board and start implementing them. And it helps, as I said, in all the regulatory functions that we have, both from clinical trials to post-marketing surveillance, to the lab testing, to the MA registrations, or at least give us a better review. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting this. Uh, I think I have also a question here for Egypt, Dr. Ibrahim. Um, there's a question um, about the uh, procedure, if that's extended to the life cycle management and the variations already. Actually, now we are the BOP list, the, the updated the guideline for post approval, it changes guideline for biological product, including the reliance pathway. And it's now open for public consultation. We wait uh, the comments for uh, all stakeholders in this guideline. Once we finish the public consultation phase, we will apply reliance on post approval changes and life cycle management. Very good. So we can, so industry and stakeholders can currently uh, comment on your guidelines. So it's good to yes. highlight. Yes, and, and we hope uh, to receive everyone. your comments also. Yes, perfect. Good reminder for everyone. Thank you. Um, I think there's another question. Um, would a market that uses a stringent regulator CPP, for example, from the EMEA, automatically consider timelines under the recognition or a bridge pathway? Or would the health authority need to be approached independently per submission? Is there anyone who wants to take this question? I understand that um, the timelines actually for the reliance procedures um, are defined very much locally. 
right? Marie, do you do you know? Yes, any? I think I, I, I'm 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 trying to make sure that I understand the question. Is it a question? So, if you use a CPP from a uh, regulatory authorities, is there a defined uh, uh, timelines for approval? And they, the the answer is is no. But obviously, we're hoping that uh, you know it's it facilitates and it accelerates the the authorization. But I think it's as you mentioned, Angelica, it's for each country to decide when they are looking at this recognition slash reliance mechanism. Uh, what additional um, evaluation do they have to do? And so what timelines do they can they look at? Uh, but obviously you would hope that uh, it is uh, an acceleration because you're relying uh, for regarding the quality, you're relying to a certain extent to, to the evaluation of, of a stringent regulatory authority. So yeah, we would look at abbreviated, which are defining exactly the time frame. We will look at abbreviated uh, timeline, yes. Maybe I can add a question to this one, maybe to Dr. Horton, because you mentioned that you're using <clears throat> a lot of procedures, CRP, uh, but also other procedures. Is the local reliance step, I would say, or the uh, timeline always the same, the same pathway, or do you also have target a different uh, national implementation, or is it always a uniform uh, procedure and structure and timeline, whatever uh, procedure you rely on? Yeah, it all depends. That's why we have an overarching uh, reliance guideline that talks about all these reliance pathways and their submissions requirement. Either WTO CRP, SRE CRP, Sweet Medis, Wahoo, and also AVRF. Uh, uh, okay, so each of them have various components. For small molecules, like for medicines registration, the normal timeline for our registration is 120 days. But using the reliance pathways drop to 60 days. Why? Because the issue of the GMP inspections has been addressed because when we rely on it, we'll see all the unretired reports and inspections that will cut the timing of we going out to do some inspections outside and also the review procedure. For AVRF, I think it's so good. The review of that period was 60 days. But when you go through joint review, you have 30 days. But for emergencies, 10 to 15 days. So because it's a joint review at the continental level and also the UAU at the regional level, the timeline dropped to 50%. And it has been uh, wonderful to even aid some of our processes. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have here a question for Dr. Bouguera. Um, for Algeria, the new regulations have now been um, established and agreed. Uh, how far have they been implemented? And is this a bridge process already being routinely used or are you still in a pilot procedure? Or can you highlight, explain a bit more where, where you are? D'accord, donc euh, la réglementation, le cadre réglementaire qui régisse. Euh, non, pour le régulateur. Le framework pour l'autorisation. Pour les pharmaceutiques ou les produits, nous pouvons reconnaître les évaluations, les rapports et d'autres autorités avec qui nous avons signé des conventions. Et l'abréviation abrégée, c'est la uh, evaluation has been uh, set by minister, uh, the minister. Uh, so we have considered it for the uh, pharmaceutical product and uh, uh, the regulator's authority and the authority with whom we have signed uh, conventions. Uh, we, are th we have been working with all those. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is actually another question for you. And the question is um, how Al Algeria is working with the rest of the African agencies regarding, uh, I would say, collaboration together or um, rec uh, reliance on other African uh, countries. We have a bilateral agreement with the Tunisia, Mauritania. We are now identifying other partners with whom we're going to sign some of the convention. And uh, 
it's going to be mutual recognitions with uh, uh, those other uh, countries and partners. Thank you. Thank you. That is interesting progress. And that also shows that it's not north-south. It's a, also a kind of collaboration between the African countries is very important also on a bilateral uh, basis. Um, Dr. Houghton, we take perhaps the last question. Um, what did NAFDAQ do very well or not so well? Ah, I think you, you already yeah. answered this. It. Sorry, that's still here. Um, one last question. Um, that's a long one for everyone. Um, for Nigeria, what is the difference in review timelines between standard and reliance processes? I think you have already highlighted that. That has basically has half the timeline. For Egypt, um, is that small molecules the same gu reliance guidance uh, that we have, or is it a different one? And they had this one, a new one, actually. So um, you should uh, refer to our website, uh, published uh, uh, new uh, guidelines for reliance for small molecule is published on our website. So uh, you can refer to our website. Thank you. And then for Algeria, last question, is there a possibility to switch a marketing authorization application that is still under review from a standard pathway to a reliance pathway in the midst of the procedure? Uh, sorry, we didn't uh, get the question prop properly. Can you please repeat? Thank you. Yeah, is, is there a possibility to switch a marketing authorization application that is already under review to a reliance pathway? I can help if we need it. Est-ce que, est que vous pouvez en, uh, est-ce que vous pouvez changer en fait? Uh, un standard pathway, un, un pathway traditionnel, le convertir en pathway de reliance pour un dossier déjà soumis. Je n'ai pas vraiment saisi euh, la question, mais euh, la procédure... Je n'ai pas vraiment compris la question, mais la procédure que nous avons acceptée pour le pro, projet est... pour un password normal, standard, et après, vous, vous discutez, vous changez, vous dites, ah non, finalement, je, voulais, je voudrais appliquer un reliance. C'est ça que j'ai compris de la question. On applique la, la reconnaissance ou la reliance pour certains produits. We have applied the recognition or reliance for other products, that is clear. Pour les produits concernés, et la liste des produits But... But if uh, that authorization is not uh, signed by uh, the, mini the ministry and uh, there is possibility to, uh, to register on uh, strict regulations or authorities recognize, we can, rec we can recognize the report against an uh, uh, abbreviated uh, evaluation. The pharmaceutical dossier is not when it's not uh, in uh, full complete it and it's a partial um uh, uh, file we still can uh, change it i hope i have uh, answered to your yeah. question yeah thank you very much i think i was clear that you can uh, it depends and you can do that so thank you very much for this very interesting insights. I think we have uh, also tried to answer a lot of questions from the audience. And so we, we appreciate all your openness and your sharing from your experience. I think in conclusion, um, I hope we were able to show also to the audience that many of the agencies in Africa are already adopting reliance pathways. So it's no longer a question, should we do reliance? It's a question of how do we do reliance and uh, what can we do in, on the practical side? What can facilitate basically the reliance uh, pathways for us? So reliance is really a 21st century like, regulatory tool that is benefiting patients and public health. I think that is what is clear and that is what everybody is working towards. And uh, I hope we also have shown you that with this session um, that we have a regulatory, uh, we need to have a regular exchange between 
the regulators, but also the users of the reliance procedures to make sure that we can capture all these learnings and all the insights and uh, share the best practices across countries, across uh, stakeholders, and so really um, fine tune the operations of the reliance procedures to make it easy for everyone and basically a win-win situations, not only for regulators and industry, but most importantly, of course, for all the patients that we are serving. Uh, as a whole. And with that, I would like to close the session, thank my speakers very much, thank the audience for the interesting questions, and uh, I send you to the coffee break. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second part of today's session of IFPMA's Africa Regulatory Conference. It's a pleasure for me to be here to facilitate uh, today's discussion, which will actually be a segue of uh, the Reliance session that we had uh, just before. Um, and just before we get started, uh, I'd like to announce that, unfortunately, Dr. Farida, who is representing uh, ANPP in our panel today, won't be able to join us as she was called on a last minute emergency meeting. Uh, so we will have our discussion and presentations with the two other panelists that we had uh, planned to, to join us today. Um, so in case, if needed, we'll wrap up the, the session a bit earlier, but we will still continue to, to have the, the session with the Q&As and the presentations that we had planned uh, before. Uh, and just before we start the session today as i was mentioning earlier we will talking about uh we'll be talking about post approval changes as you see in the title um and to give a, a bit of a, an introduction um when we talk about post approval changes we're also referred to sometimes as variations um these are changes that are made to a product uh, composition to the product manufacturing process to steps in the quality control of, of the, uh, the product manufacturing facilities, et cetera. Uh, and these changes are made for the purpose of uh, maintaining the routine production of, of a product. Uh, we might be talking about biologics, small molecules, vaccines. Uh, all of them have these uh, changes made during their manufacturing process. Vaccines are particularly uh, affected uh, and the WHO's presentation today will actually be focused more on the vaccines uh, side of, of things. Um, and as you might imagine, any change made to a product that's already licensed may impact on the quality, on the safety, on the efficacy of a product. Uh, and even if we're not talking about the product itself, if we're looking at the information associated to the product, uh, any changes to that might also impact the safe and effective use of, of a product. So post-approval changes, and you'll hear uh, a lot about it today, not just uh, the not, not just the actual term spelled out, but also its abbreviation, PACS. So for those of you who are not familiar uh, with this topic, you will be hearing a lot about PACS today. Um, so PACS to the registered information of an authorized product uh, are routinely introduced at a global scale, as I mentioned before, to enable a robust and efficient manufacturing process. They also help make sure that the supply of a product remains uh, timely and stable over time, uh, and they are used to improve the quality control techniques of uh, manufacturing. And the challenges that we face with PACS is that it can be actually difficult to implement these changes at a global scale precisely because of the complexity of global supply chains that we have, not only in the pharmaceutical industry, but, uh, but also, and because of the unpredictable requirements that we see uh, in different NRAs around the world. So today we'll be talking about uh, potential solutions uh, and different approaches to how to deal with this. And because the session is focused on reliance, we will hear on how global regulatory convergence can improve the current global scape for global landscape for PACs and how convergence and harmonization are really a, a stepping stone in implementing reliance for the entire product life cycle of, uh, of medicinal products. This will contrib contribute to making sure patients have continued access to quality medicines and vaccines with also up-to-date product safety, safety information that we know is so important for uh, a safe use of products. So in this session, we will look at the challenges faced by the industry and NRAs in optimizing the management of post-approval changes, discuss how implementation of reliance can assist in addressing such changes, uh, such challenges, and we will have presentations by representatives of the industry. We have here with us uh, Dr. Francesca Mangia, who's representing IFPMA. And we have Dr. Yang Yang Lei from WHO, who will be delivering a, a presentation uh, just after my brief introduction. We'll also have a Q&A with the audience. 
uh, as we'll have a bit more time during the session, I encourage you to please submit your, your questions using the Q&A tool in Zoom, as you did for the previous session. And I'll try to address those two to our speakers today. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to our first speaker and the first presentation to be delivered by Dr. Tian Liang from WHO. The floor is yours, doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be invited to give a presentation on WHO positions on post-approval change uh, to vaccine. Uh, will I share my screen or Sergio, you, you share from your end? We have the screens for, uh, shared from our end. Okay, okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Daniel Lee. I'm working in WHO uh, Hydrocode in Geneva. We are uh, in the division uh, for access to uh, medicines and other health products. And as you know, WHO is working together with all of the stakeholders and that for a healthier world is what it uh, was announced by our uh, Director General Tedros. Next slide, please. Um, one of the most important part of our work is development and establish uh, and promote the international standard for food, biologicals, and pharmaceuticals. And the setting nominal standard and promoting the use of these are WHO core functions, which was uh, you know, uh, clearly demanded in WHO constitution. Next slide, please. Um, WHO nominal standard for biologicals and the blood product and the relative you know, in vitro diagnostic, it uh, had been done for, for the past 70 years. And uh, those reference materials include reference materials for laboratory testing and which uh, used for measurement of the uh, active, uh, the content of active uh, component of the uh, vaccines. And another one is the WHO guideline and the recommendations we so-called the written standard, which will be used by the manufacturers and the regulatory authorities uh, of WHO member state for the production quality control of biological product and even used for the regulation and licensing of a product uh, in the country. This work was accomplished through WHO biological program and the WHO collaborative centers, which uh, we have eight in uh, globally located in different parts of the world, as well as the WHO expert committee on biological standardization and so-called ECBS, where the WHO guidelines and WHO measurement standard will be reviewed by the committee and approved by the committee in its meeting. Also, development of the standard are involved in pro uh, professional communities, regional and the national regulatory authorities. I'm sure uh, some of you, I um, mean, the participant of this meeting have been involved in WHO procedures for development of WHO written standards, such as guidelines for different uh, products. And also manufacturers and the experts, uh, laboratories and the academia are also involved in WHO uh, process for development of international standard. Next slide, please. WHO Export Committee on Biological Standardization are responsible for establishing the norm and the standard for biologicals, which was established in 1947. And the, the committee made, uh, meet uh, every year and the, the, the outcome of the, of the committee, the director reported to executive, uh, executive board, uh, board of uh, WHO and also to the DG of uh, the organization. The members of the committee are composed of scientists from national regulatory authority, uh, authorities mostly, and the academia, research institutions, and the public health bodies. And the decision and the recommendations of the committee are based on in, entirely on scientific principles and the considerations for public health. Report of the committee are published in WHO technical report series. 
and which are available electronically as well uh, on WHO website. Next slide, please. The most important key elements of regulatory uh, regulation of vaccine at the National Regulatory Authority is regulation for post-approval changes. Uh, I, uh, as I, uh, as you have been heard in last session, in the reliance, also you know, post regulation of post-approval change, also uh, also in another term, other variation, it's uh, very critical or most important part of the industry as well as uh, for the national regulatory authorities. As we heard from Sergio, the changes to vaccine composition, manufacturing processes, quality control methodology, uh, change of equipment, facilities, or product labeling information also happened after vaccine had been licensed by the regulatory authority. And for the purpose of maintenance of maintaining the routine production or improving the quality attributes of the product or improving the efficacy, efficiency of manufacturing processes or updating the product labeling information. Next slide, please. The NRA and the manufacturers or the uh, MA holders should be recognized that any change to the vaccine or to the biological product may impact on the quality, safety, and the efficacy of the product. Or the change on the information associated to the vaccines may impact on the safe and effective use of the vaccines. Next slide, please. The WHO, we do encourage or we recommend each member state, each country, they should establish their national guidelines for the procedures and the criteria for evaluation of changes to marketing authorization to ensure that the vaccine of constantly quality, safety, and efficacy are distributed post marketing authorization. If NRA is so designed and the WHO guidelines on post approval change may be adopted as a definitively you know, national requirement. Uh, any modifications may be justified and made by the NRA. And the WHO, we have actually we have two guidelines for post approval change. One is for post approval change to licensed vaccines, another one is for biotherapeutic product, which is recombinant proteins and cytokines and used for therapeutic purpose. But because of the use of those two products are different, so that's why we developed a separate guidelines. And each of them are specific to the product. And, but the principles and the, the type of changes, reporting procedures are more or less the same. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the, 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 how the uh, guideline for vaccine has been developed. We start drafting the guideline uh, uh, in, in 2012 with the members com comes from USFDA, House Canada, Swedish agency, German uh, regulatory authority, um, Polish Institute, and the Indian uh, regulatory authority and the Belgium as well. And we had the consultation in March of 2013 and to review the draft guidelines. And the, the guideline uh, went through uh, two rounds of public consultations in 2014. We invited the comments from the public and mostly comments are coming from the stakeholders, the regulatory authorities and the industry. And in the ECBS, it's a meeting in 2014 and the document was reviewed and finally adopted by the committee. And the final uh, guideline was published in WHO technical report series as the annex to the ECBS report. After adoption of the document of this guideline, we have been organized the three implementation workshop, workshops. Uh, one uh, was in Thailand in 2015, one in Vietnam in 2019. And the last year we had uh, the last one was in Oman. And the uh, participants, the majority are from uh, WHO West Pacific region, Southeast uh, um, Asia and uh, Mediterranean region and African region. And the, also there are other occasions 
those the principles and WHO recommendations and the positions were presented to different in meetings like a developing country vaccine manufacturing networks and the developing country uh, regulatory networks and as well as the WHO uh, as World Vaccine Congress and in 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 Europe and APIC harmonization workshops and the PDA annual meetings in Bel uh, in Berlin. And that's the, you know, the vaccine, the, this guy that I had been shared with majority of the participants. Next slide, please. Uh, in the guideline, I'll give you a little, you know, a taste of this guideline. The guideline for the CMC change, the quality changes, and are categorized based on the potential effect of the quality change on the quality attributes of the vaccine and the potential impact on uh, of these changes on the safety or efficacy of the product. Uh, that's why we categorize the changes into major change and moderate quality change and the minor quality changes. For the safety and efficacy changes and the product labeling information changes based on the, in the, 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 the type of change and the we categorize them as a safety efficacy change product labeling information change and the urgent product labeling information change and the administrative product labeling information changes. The categorization of those changes are based on the risk uh, benefit analysis. And uh, those, uh, uh, when we develop this guideline and we categorize uh, those three changes of both DMC and uh, the major and the moderate change should be reported to uh, the regulatory authority. The minor changes will be kept by the IMA holder, and when, whenever that is requested, uh, such document should be submitted to the regulator authority for review or for uh, 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 notification as well. Next slide, please. There are different regulatory pathways. Normally, for the NRA in the producing country, and they should take the full review, to review all of these uh, submitted files. Uh, those are the supporting data to demonstrate that there is no negative impact on the quality, safety, and efficacy of the product. And for uh, most of the procuring countries, WHO do encourage, uh, go through the expedited procedures, which you know, uh, we call it the recognition of the decision of other competent regulator authorities, or call it reference uh, NRA, or review the decision of the NRA of a producing country or another competent or reference NRA, or partial review the evaluation supporting data from other, uh, or from the uh, industry. So that is uh, what we so call the reliance that we just heard from the last session and uh, on the regulation for post approval changes. However, in any of these regulations, uh, in any of these uh, regulatory pathways, the responsibility of uh, final regulatory decision is on the approval of changes still lies with the receiving NRAs. It's even you recognition the decision of all the reference NRAs, but you are the one who takes the responsibility, uh, made the decision on the vaccine used in your territory. Next slide, please. So current situation uh, of vaccine uh, production, as you know, for the, uh, the globalization of vaccine industry, it's getting um, more and more. Fewer and fewer producers are in the world and the same product are supplied to multiple countries. And the post approval change affect the multiple countries because of the vaccine are used uh, globally. So convert the regulatory uh, procedures and the re re uh, requirements on post approval change are uh, very critical or crucial. So the procedures type of changes and uh, the extent of supporting data is required to submit to the regulatory authority should be converged and uh, based on the WHO guidelines and which are, can be used as a basis for the convergence. And the WHO do encourage regulatory lines and uh, 
final decision and the final goal of the reliance will be the recognition of all the reference NRAs. The regional network and the work sharing also are uh, the aim of WHO. And WHO, uh, especially uh, in the regional phases, they are organizing uh, the regional networkers uh, uh, based on WHO uh, regional office, you know, such as you know, uh, East Mediterranean region, and where they are trying to uh, establish a network for the regulation for um, vaccines, uh, not only for post approval change, maybe for marketing authorization as well. And we heard in you know, WHO that the National Control Laboratory Network has been established very recently. And there are uh, multiple uh, national control laboratories be the member or the um, observers of the network. And that there are uh, regular meetings of this network. And uh, in the member of the network, the, the, the aim of the network is recognition of the lottery release certificate from the members of the uh, network. So there are uh, different initiatives and activities uh, conducted by WHO, and uh, in the future, uh, there will be more and more networkers and uh, people are uh, working together to build uh, the, the confidence between uh, the members of the network and to reach the uh, final goal of recognition for regulatory decisions in other reference uh, authorities. Next slide, please. And the, the, uh, the reliance, you know, there are different uh, ways of uh, recognition. One is the mutual recognition where, you know, uh, two parties to recognize each other, uh, the decision from each other. Those are the we call the mutual uh, uh, recognition. Those based on the mutual confidence, which, you know, built it between the uh, regulatory authority. Another one is one-way recognition, unilateral recognition. It's a decision of the NRA. You may recognize all the decisions in your, in, you have a list with so-called reference uh, regulatory authorities. In any way, the manufacturers should be informed or be involved in the establishment of this agreement between regulatory authority. Next slide, please. Very important that also we heard in the last session, the confidentiality of the uh, technical data. And the NRA association should establish work sharing procedures that ensure the protection of confidential uh, information with the engagement of the MA holders and experts on the uh, proprietary laws of each country. Any regional association or network of NRA should add uh, at a minimum, ensure the confidential nature of the technical information in the uh, marketing authorization or the license application, especially the information on the product quality. So those are very important part. The NRAs should be aware of, uh, those data are confidential and should not be uh, make it openly. Next slide, please. I think that's the the the, uh, the last slide of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions from the participants uh, in the chat or, or question and answer uh, uh, function. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Liang Liang. I think this is a very comprehensive presentation. And just as a reminder to everyone, you know this. The slides from uh, today's and the other sessions will be available on the website for you to consult after the, the conference. Uh, so we'll be making those available. And thank you once again for your uh, presentation on WHO's activities on post-approval changes. And with that, I'd like to give the floor to Francesca. Francesca is uh, with Roche and today she will be representing uh, the industry. She'll be speaking on behalf of IFPMA and give some case studies that will illustrate the, the challenges and, and opportunities uh, in post approval change management. Uh, Francesca? Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Sergio, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So as mentioned by Sergio, my name is Francesca Manja, and uh, I am International Regulatory Manager in the Policy and International Operation Group at Roche. 
And today I'll be presenting on behalf of uh, uh, IFPMA. So it's a really great pleasure for me to be here today and uh, have the possibility to contribute and discuss about optimizing regulatory frameworks for management of post-approval changes for patients' benefit. So today I will talk about challenges and opportunities on optimizing post-approval change management. And uh, next slide, please. Um, also about the why and uh, how to do that following the industry position. While in the second part of the presentation, uh, I will uh, show a case studies uh, from uh, my company using Reliance for uh, post-approval changes. Next slide, please. So introducing changes post-approval is uh, definitely uh, an essential part of the life cycle uh, of a product to really ensure continuous supply of high quality medicines and vaccines support also continuous innovation and improvement of uh, facility, manufacturing methods, process controls, but also uh, analytical techniques, and also to um, address unmet medical needs through uh, accelerated product development and registration process, where obviously and consequently also more changes uh, will need to be uh, implemented post-approval and in a timely manner. So despite the criticality of uh, post-approval changes and the fact that they actually represent the majority of all filings, the current regulatory frameworks for uh, managing uh, PACs uh, globally are very diverse and therefore challenging. And uh, um, you see um, an example here in the graph uh, uh, in this map uh, is yeah, where basically we have uh, several and different uh, uh, global approval timelines. And uh, uh, is, this is only one of the factors that contributes to the challenge of managing parks from an industry perspective. And eventually this leads to uh, little agility, also hinders innovation and continuous improvement uh, and can contribute to patients delayed access to medicines or vaccines and drug shortages. Next slide, please. So there are different uh, views and perspectives uh, when looking at uh, post-approval changes. So from a, a regulatory agency point of view, uh, one change is uh, equal to one submission and uh, one assessment. However, from the industry point of view, uh, this is much more complex. As one change is, is equal to multiple submissions, uh, as country have country-specific requirements, which lead to multiple dossier, and eventually, uh, eventually to multiple uh, assessment as each NRA comes back with questions. This leads to obviously a lengthy and uh, complex process with multiple changes you can imagine uh, creating a, a dramatic amplification. Next slide, please. But again, as mentioned before, this is uh, uh, not only about the timelines, these are not the only challenges as the current, the current uh, uh, regulatory landscape for post-approval changes uh, shows uh, uh, inconsistent classif classification system, um, often specific and supple supplementary local data as mentioned before and format requirements are requested and timelines which often are unpredictable and uh, with uh, variable approval and uh, uh, divergent in interpretation and decision by regulators which nevertheless is based on the same data. And finally, also um, the variable implementation periods uh, which um, are present after uh, approval. And as a result, this can lead to um, duplication of efforts by both sides, industry and the regulators worldwide, which then results in additional time to review and increasing the backlog of post-approval changes and may also potentially divert the focus away from really uh, critical changes. Uh, also, we would end up uh, in, a, uh, in having delayed submissions and staggered approval timelines. Uh, and a diverse or unpredictable change implementation period after approvals. So ultimately these factors really uh, lead to challenges in managing uh, inventories and supplying product due to staggered of, uh, staggering of approved uh, regulatory in different countries and uh, or delays in change implementation until approval in all countries. So. Next slide, please. 
So uh, this is um, this is our 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 vision and uh, a way to uh, how to address uh, those challenges. Uh, and our vision is really striving for uh, global regulatory convergence of handling post-approval changes using science and risk-based approaches. Really. Um, key enabler to access and continuous supply of uh, medicines and vaccines to patients. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, so then, what is what's what's the way forward and uh, to address these challenges? And as you see here, is a global challenges require global solution. So, the way forward to address these challenges is summarizing these slides and. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, really uh, the use of reliance uh, uh, should be maximized. And uh, for this, I would like to mention and ref refer again to the uh, WHO uh, good reliance uh, practice, uh, also applied to the to the whole life cycle, but also leverage uh, documents for ref from reference agency and uh, enable information sharing uh, among regulators. So, also, requirements for uh, for submission of post approval changes should be converged, meaning that data requirements for post approval changes should be adapted to the risk uh, level and limited to those that are really scientifically justifiable. Um, then also uh, risk taking into consideration risk based approach. It is critical really to harmonize requirements and timelines of post approval changes. So, for example, a site transfer should be the same change category across the globe. And uh, so it is really important to harmonize this on a, a global basis. And uh, for this, also, um, I would like to reference back to the WHO guidelines for variation, which serves as a global standard. Um, also, um, considering maximizing the use of the uh, ICH uh, Q12 tools, for instance, PSEMP, so post approval change management protocol as a quick win, but also as mentioned before, um, establishing uh, change categories uh, according to the level of risk providing a global standard classification approach and uh, uh, leveraging uh, uh, the pharmaceutical quality system for changes uh, with no quality impact. Also, it is important to allow uh, flexible implementation timelines, which are needed to ensure smooth transition on and supply continuity of the uh, post-change uh, uh, product material. Uh, while some while approval could might still be uh, ongoing, and then finally, uh, definitely uh, last but definitely not least, uh, emergency preparedness. Uh, we have seen it with the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, these has brought regulators uh, together and it has brought them to rethink on uh, how changes really should be managed, and especially in a in an emergency accelerating review timelines and having trust and collaboration between industry and regulators. Next slide, please. So here I added for reference the IFPMA position paper and the publication, which I referenced to, uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout my presentation. And uh, you will find the link here. So if you want to know more about post-approval change challenges and the industry proposed solution for um, really for a more flexible and uh, aligned global system, please uh, check them out. Next slide, please. So I will now move to the second part of the presentation where I will uh, uh, introduce a, a case study focusing on applying reliance to uh, post-approval variation. So this case study shows a, a drug product site transfer for a monoclonal antibody A. Next slide, please. So through a, a PACMP, which is uh, acronym for uh, uh, post-approval change management protocol, uh, this site transfer was downgraded to CBE 30 in the US and a type one and type one B in the EU. And the uh, <clears throat> PACMP is a two-step process. So the first step consists in filing uh, an approval of the protocol through a major uh, variation, which usually 
take 60 days in the EU and four months uh, in the US. And the second step consists of data submission and variation downgrade. Now, through the approval of the protocol in advance, so with step one, and downgrading of the reporting category during step two, we could achieve five months faster approval of this change compared to a traditional approach. Next slide, please. However, as you can see from this uh, uh, graph on the on the on the left, uh, it still takes long time to approve such a change globally. Uh, this graph shows the approval timelines in months uh, for this variation. So for this uh, MAB A uh, site transfer in all submitting countries, which you see on the uh, Y axis. And uh, as you can see, in some countries, it takes up to five years to approve the change. And this, of course, you can imagine how uh, it can also uh, put uh, our supply under a lot of stress to build uh, bridging supply stock and they cannot implement the change until the approval. In orange, in both graphs, um, are highlighted countries uh, that have used uh, um, rely that have used uh, formal or informal reliance pathways to approve the change, and the average approval timelines for those countries using uh, uh, formal or informal reliance was two and a half months, while uh, the average approval timelines for countries using using a standard pathway was eleven point three months. So as as you can see, uh, really a significant uh, improvement in and shorten of the timelines when using reliance. Uh, something also to uh, to say is that there is a lot of uh, uh, diversity in terms of uh, requirements. For instance, uh, the fact that some countries uh, see a site transfer as a new registration and therefore require full dossier uh, like an IMA. Also, a country requesting real-time stability data, additional chromatography, and the legalization of part of the dossier, uh, as well as uh, registration testing. So these divergent requirements, uh, along with uh, uh, lack of resources at health authority uh, and lack of reliance pathways, really resulted in staggered global approval timelines. Uh, and as you can see, leading to more than four years uh, uh, to approve and implement this change globally. Next slide, please. So, nevertheless, we have already some uh, very good example from uh, countries where formal or inform, formal or informal reliance pathway is efficiently and successfully applied to post-approval changes. And Singapore is surely one of the best example of uh, using uh, reliance for variation and really fully maximizing the, the use of resources. So, Singapore Health Authority started with, uh, with a pilot to gain experience and since 2017 uses the verification route uh, for uh, PAC review, uh, relying on the reference authority approval letter. Other examples uh, uh, from the presented uh, map A case study um, are from uh, United Arab Emirates and Albania, uh, which um, have used informal uh, reliance pathway leveraging on one K on, on one case, so for UAE, the on the EU approval letter and CPP while for Albania uh, relying on the EU approval letter alone. And as you can see for UA UAE, uh, the approval was granted in only three, three days, really showing an incredible uh, reliance for excellence. But overall, the approval timelines for uh, uh, Albania were also very short. Also, registration testing was waived and no questions were, uh, were asked by any of the three health authorities. So, and these, of course, are very uh, promising examples, uh, and we hope to see more and more uh, around the world. Next slide, please. So what are the consideration um, when implementing reliance for post-approval changes? Um, as mentioned before, surely uh, leveraging on the available uh, reference documentation, so CPP, when the variation, of course, triggers a change in the CPP, but also other reference documents like the approval letter and the assessment report uh, if, if it is issued by the uh, reference NRA. 
Also, in terms of review timelines, uh, uh, when reliance is applied during uh, using uh, reference documentation, the post-approval change review of the reference agency should be recognized and approved locally in a shorter time. Also, we have talked uh, about convergence uh, and to facilitate reliance practice, convergence uh, of requirement is certainly a key enabler and the reduction of uh, national specific requirements uh, uh, is really important for a long-term success. And finally, uh, product sameness. Uh, uh, applicants really um, need to assure regulators that products are essentially the same or sufficiently uh, similar. And any difference with the reference country uh, uh, dossier supporting the post-approval change need to be explained and justified by the applicant, for instance, in a Cooper letter. Next slide, please. So um, here are some additional consideration for the implementation of uh, reliance for post-approval changes. And I will not go into um, details, but also uh, just mentioning that for the documentation, applicants uh, should confirm that the proposed change is the same as the approved in the reference agency. And then in order to reduce um, regulatory burden, timelines should be predictable and uh, transparent. And finally, um, worth of mention is that the agency may consider to uh, start with a pilot period, for instance, uh, to really accumulate some experience for uh, both sides from uh, agency, but also uh, industry side. Uh, next slide, please. So with this, I, I move to the, to the outlook and uh, uh, reliance when used for IMA, we say that it should be like a marriage and it should last for a lifetime. But of course, uh, uh, life is unexpected and sometimes it requires some flexibilities. So we encourage to consider that even if uh, you use uh, uh, reliance at uh, uh, IMA, so at initial marketing authorization, there might be different uh, indication in different countries, for instance, due to different population. Or for instance, if reliance has not been used at IMA, uh, it is important to still consider it for post-approval changes uh, for the same product. So to conclude, I would like to highlight again how really trust, uh, transparency, and open and continuous dialogue are keys to reliance, and that to what WHO regulate to reliance is the hallmark of a modern and efficient regulatory authority. So with this, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention and a special thank you to the IFPA members that developed the position paper and the publication and supported the presentation with, uh, with feedback. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. I think you made a very interesting analogy at the end, uh, comparing it to a marriage. And I would like to discuss that with you and with the participants. Um, as my colleague Anna Maria is reminding everyone in the chat, please feel free now to use the, the Q&A uh, function at uh, Zoom to share with us your thoughts and any questions that you'd like to have our panelists uh, answering today. So unfortunately, we won't be able to have a, a regulator with us uh, in, in the panel today to get that uh, perspective from a national agency. But I would like to invite anyone in the room from uh, different agencies that are participating in the conference. We know that we have some participants from agencies in the African region. So if you're there, um, please do share your thoughts uh, on the Q&A and I'll make sure that we, we add those um, to, to the discussion today. Uh, but to kick us off with uh, just a general sense, let's say of how this topic is in important for uh, industry and for NRAs. Um, one thing I'd like to ask you, Francesca, is would you be able to give us a general uh, sense of what is the, the impact of post-approval changes in the, in the workload within the company? I mean, is this, because I think from someone who is not coming from uh, a regulatory or, or a post-approval change space, um, it might not be so clear why this is a big uh, topic for for us. 
Would you give us some some um, comments on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, thanks, Sergio, for for the question. So, I mean, as I mentioned during during the the presentation, uh, post approval changes are really essential, and uh, is it's clearly part of the life cycle, and they really represent uh, the highest number of regulatory submissions. And what it's important also to consider is that. Uh, the number of post-approval changes increases with product complexity, if we think about a small molecule to large molecule and vaccines. So from a company perspective, managing such an heterogeneous uh, uh, PACS uh, regulation is uh, uh, a challenge as from one side, we have companies that of course are globalized. So ideally we will have one product for one world, but then in reality, uh, um, we have, um, on the other hand, the regulatory approvals are also nationalized. So we have a hundred plus approval for one product uh, change. And uh, uh, the main challenge is uh, then that adds to that is the fact that uh, one submissions, one filing can lead to several registration dossier with different content. And this is because different countries have uh, specific requirements and therefore generate different Q and A's uh, adding complexity and really leading to many different dossier version approved for essentially the same product. And uh, uh, this result then in delayed of approval timelines and uh, a huge complexity to manage the different dossier version uh, from a sponsor's perspective. And uh, another, uh, challenge is, another challenge is uh, uh, definitely uh, represented by the fact that uh, Every agency wants to carry their own regulatory review. So there is a lot of uh, duplication of effort and resources and new submissions uh, resulting long and the different approval timelines uh, with different than timing at which uh, the product can be available for, for patients. So ideally we should really leverage uh, uh, the efforts uh, and the resources uh, efficiently and therefore shorten approval timelines and really trying to free up resources at the level of NRAs, but also at the level of uh, uh, yeah, the industry level, because differently from what we might think, resources at, uh, uh, at the industry are also not unlimited. So we should really try to focus and channel those uh, where it's really critical and, and needed. And uh, also one, one other challenge is, as, as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, is uh, definitely the unpredictable uh, change implementation periods uh, after the approval, which again may result in uh, delaying or staggering submissions. So, so as, as I, I, I want to, to mention again, I, I see and identify really three key elements as a way forward on that, which is definitely global harmonization and convergence and adoption of reliance mechanism and adoption of risk-based approach. No, th thanks, Francesca. Um, I hear your um, highlights of, you know, we all want to uh, optimize the use of resources, whether that's from the industry side, uh, from the NRA side, also because by optimizing it with free resources to allocate to other uh, priority areas, right? So. I think this is a, a common theme throughout the, the conference and for, for today in particular, while we talk about the use of reliance as a, a resource optimization uh, tool. Um, now going to Professor uh, Yang Yang, and I know that we've, we've seen very interesting and comprehensive data from uh, Francesca's presentation on how different countries have different um, timelines for approval and different categories for, for variations. Uh, but from a WHO perspective, where do you see countries um, evolving or, or aligning with WHO guidelines? I mean, do you see a lot of divergence between countries? Do you see any evolution over time of countries getting um, more convergent and working towards aligning with the WHO definitions? Um, how do you see this uh, changing? You're on mute. Sorry. Sorry for that. Yeah, I noted, you know, the in the in her presentation, you know, there are you know diversity of review time or 
you know, so how many months have been lost that to approve a change. In WHO guideline, we clearly give them a guidance on how long will be the maximum uh, time slot for approval of a majority change or moderate change. Uh, which is clearly in the one of the appendix of WHO guideline. We recommend uh, six months for major change and three months for moderate change. And those uh, can be uh, followed by WHO member state. And uh, w as I mentioned in my presentation, we have been organized a couple of implementation workshops and what the WHO recommended, not only the uh, the time slot, the timeline for a review of or for approval of a change, but also the data needed to support the change and the data required to review uh, by the regulatory authorities. Also, are uh, you know, uh, introduced or briefed to the participating regulatory authorities. Also, in the workshop, we provided them uh, multiple case studies to the participant. And we provided them examples. Uh, majority of them are real cases we got from the industry. And we, we provided to the participant and they will analyze the, the type of changes, what type of change it will be, and what kind of supporting data is needed to support the change. And those implementation workshop was really welcomed by the participant. And um, that's why we uh, you know, organized the implementation workshop and to implement what WHO recommended in its guideline. And not only on the, you know, the time slot to, to be used for approval or change. And I know the country, they have, um, different capacities in different uh, countries and uh, maybe they they do not have the uh, you know uh, enough human resources and to to do the work that's why i heard from industry some changes even took them to get the approval for two or three years even like that that's why we to develop another guideline so-called uh, you know guidelines for a uh, good regulatory uh, practices and another one is good reliance practices, which provided the principles to the regulatory authority of WHO map state and to be followed to to, to converge and to get the to converge the requirement and the, and the uh, not only the timeline but also the technical data and also uh, encouraging the recognition and the reliance of you know the regulatory decision based on another reference to regulatory authorities. Also, WHO uh, listed the regulatory authority. Also, it's one of the uh, a, a, you know information the country you can refer to which regulatory authority has been re reached the level four or level three, which they can rely on their decision, and you can get that information from WHO website and to support uh, your list of reference regulatory authorities. Thank you. Well, thank you for that insight. Um, and thank you for sort of steering the, the discussion a bit on the on the reliance front, because I think that's where we want to, to get as well. Um, and I see we have a lot already some some questions from the audience, which is great. Please continue uh, using the the Q and A function to send in those questions, and I'll ask them to our panelists in in a bit. But just before that, um, I think the question we we all want to to hear the answer, but is not might not be necessarily easy to to find that uh, here today, is what are the, the challenges and solutions that countries uh, might need to explore to implement reliance that really encompasses the entire life cycle of medicines or vaccines. Um, Francesca, you highlighted in your presentation some, some examples like from UAE, Singapore, Albania. Um, any ideas on why are not more countries taking this approach? Um, yeah, maybe let's focus on the challenges first, and then we will discuss some potential solutions. 
Yeah. Um, yes, sure. Uh, so yeah, I, I, as I mentioned in the in the presentation, I went through some some of the challenges, and uh, um, something that we uh, still see in several countries, even when uh, um, trying to apply reliance, is that. For instance, the full review is still performed even when the assessment report or the approval letter from the from the reference agency is uh, is provided. While ideally the the decision should be based on the review uh, of the assessment report itself, so this often leads to approval timelines which um, are equal to standard uh, review ones because the decision is based on full review, which takes much longer time. And uh, again, this approach duplicates um, the, the, the work at the reference agency and um, we lose really on, on efficiency. And um, the other aspects which I think I, I touched upon before, it's also with regards to country specific, country specific requirements that are often uh, requested even though the same dossier as the one provided uh, at the reference agency is also uh, submitted. And so this uh, uh, lead in, leads to duplication of uh, effort and again, loss of efficiency at uh, industry level. Um, and uh, again, the PAC classification system, which uh, is uh, um, unpredictable, and uh, uh, and the other uh, points which uh, uh, I mentioned before, it's with regard to product sameness, uh, which is uh, es essential for the user reliance. Uh, however, there is no, there needs to be a mutual and clear understanding of uh, product sameness uh, for reliance purpose. Uh, uh, so it's really important to uh, um, build that. Uh, understanding and transparency between the parties, uh, highlighting the differences uh, and uh, justifying them really. Um, also, as I mentioned uh, on in a cover letter, but also having the possibility, for instance, uh, to have the dialogue and discussion in a pre-submission meeting and and uh, this really highlight that. Yeah, and just before I go to Professor Liang Liang, to pick up on something you said, uh, Francesca, about country specific requirements, because we have a question in the Q and A. Um, do you have any any examples to share in terms of uh, country specific requirements that are particularly problematic um, in in the region that we that deviate from international standards? Yeah. So uh, thanks for the question. We have um, we we see quite recurrently requesting, for instance. Uh, uh, executed batch record and uh, master batch record for submission, which of course uh, are um, it's quite lengthy to to provide uh, COAs, but also uh, additional uh, real time stability data, which I mentioned before, also in the during the presentation, and these are all. Um, um, country specific documents, uh, which, uh, uh, as Sergio said, deviates and really do not add additional um, value to the uh, variation in scope or the submission in scope uh, and that uh, can be justified and waived. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so, Professor Yang Yang, from your perspective, um, what are countries, what are the challenges that countries are facing when trying to, to implement reliance uh, at a national level, uh, also for, for post-approval changes? Yes, I think uh, the, the the agencies in different countries they are facing different challenges. In, uh, they have uh, their uh, national law, whether that will be allowed it to recognize the decision for other countries. Some of them they may not the law require them they have to do by themselves. Some country may have uh, uh, flexibility to accept the, the decisions of other reference regulator authorities. I think that that's the uh, you know, biggest challenge. Sometimes it's really very difficult to change the law. You have to go go through the you know the, the Congress and to get the law to be modified. And uh, sometimes the, the 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 law may give a flexibility, but the guidelines you should develop how to accept the decision 
or relying on others' decision um, on the marketing authorization or post-approval change of, of uh, vaccines. I think that's the, you know, the most uh, biggest challenge. Another one is uh, also um, how how would the reference agency share their assessment report is another very you know, bigger concern of the receiving countries. We heard from a lot of participating countries in our workshop. They said uh, sometimes the NRA, they do not provide their assessment report. It's only the decision. When the decision is approved or not. You know, sometimes the, the, the receiving country, they wanted to have an assessment report to get more information on how um, the decision was made by the reference NRA, whether this uh, a specific change uh, had an impact on the quality or not. But they want to have much more uh, insight of uh, you know, the analysis. That's why um, the communication between NRAs, between agencies, is, or build the confidences between the uh, regulator authorities are very, very much important. That's why some WHO is organizing different uh, occasions and uh, to invite different regulator authorities sitting in the same room and we discuss on the uh, particular issue, specific issue, and to, to let them to know each other and to understand the procedures and the, understand the same the science behind the decision and the build of the confidence between the regulatory authorities. I think that's also is a very important way to solve the problem. Uh, the, you know, FPMA, you are organizing the regulatory conference for African countries. Although this is a very good uh, uh, you know, uh, practice, even it's a virtual meeting. I think the best way is you know, people sitting in the same meeting room and they know each other, they chat each other, and they share their challenges in their country when dealing with not only post approval change, but also marketing authorizations. And that they can share their challenge and that they learn from each other and that they can you know, get input from other participating countries. Then they can build their confidence between each other. Then that will be easy for them to. Uh, step to another forward or uh, re rely on other regulatory authority. Thank you. Thanks. And maybe just building on that, um, anything from the industry side that you see that uh, could be, we could more actively be uh, doing to, to try and facilitate this uh, appliance of reliance for post-approval changes uh, from countries? And Francesca, I guess also would be interesting to hear your your thoughts on this one as well, of course. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can start to Francisca. You can you can add. You know, normally when we organize the workshop or the meetings with regulator authorities, ma majority uh, of the situation we invite the industry to be part of that meeting. Like uh, the implementation workshop of a post approval change, we invite FPMA to be, you know, part of the participant. We have a very good participation from work and from GSK and from other uh, vaccine manufacturers as well. And they contributed a lot because they they are really dealing with the changes, you know, dealing with, I mean, daily uh, on different parts of the, uh, different type of changes. They can share their experience and you know, what type of change is critical uh, or what type of change is most important and they can share their information. Uh, another one is um, if the NRA, uh, if the industry, they have the assessment report on a particular change received from the uh, from the uh, NRA for producing country, the industry they can share the assessment report rather than you know from the uh, uh, NRA directly. The industry, if you submit your document to, to the receiving country. You can attach the assessment report which you received from the, like from EMA or from uh, USFDA or from other reference uh, regulatory authorities. You can share that with the receiving countries. That can is kind of um, uh, build the confidence or build the confidence of uh, the receiving NRA on the safety of the product. 
Francesca, would you like to comment? Yes. Um, no, thanks, uh, Dian Liang. And um, I mean, I would like to start answering that. I believe that really the base for this moving forward are um, really trust and open dialogue and sharing information. That's really uh, what is at the base. And from an industry perspective, I think uh, um, we are aware that we should continue improving um, advanced planning of changes really at the beginning of the start of the life cycle and uh, have a more uh, maybe strategic combination of those changes uh, uh, as well as again a clear communication of uh, what are the supply challenges uh, uh, how can we address them uh, uh, look at them uh, from a whole maybe more holistic way and share them uh, with regulators and something that also I, I mentioned before is uh, to really consider starting with a pilot. And because with that, you can gain experience for really both sides. It's not just uh, uh, the agency, but it's also from a sponsor's perspective that uh, a lot of uh, uh, learnings come from. And uh, um, those learnings can then be uh, adapted and reiterated and uh, uh, share with other um, with other uh, agencies. Uh, so it's really uh, something to uh, take uh, into consideration as well. And uh, um, to to reply to also to meant to touch upon what uh, uh, Dr. Lay uh, said about the assessment report. Um, we believe that the uh, assessment report is really valuable and. Uh, um, for, uh, for Reliance because it really provides insights into the um, decision-making process of the reference authority. So where and when available, um, this report should really be the primary source uh, of information to support Reliance. Um, so we really encourage the, the NRA that, that want to implement Reliance uh, uh, to use them. And for instance, uh, even the uh, European uh, Public Assessment Report contains in practice uh, very few uh, reductions and is uh, in, in, in reality very informative. Uh, so in the absence, of course, of um, public assessment report or if the relying NLA requires more details uh, uh, to take the decision, of course, uh, um, may require them to see uh, these confidential documents uh, and ideally this should be uh, requested from NRA to NRA so that the confidential information and an agreement is uh, is in place. But definitely we support the concept of reliance and recognizing the uh, the facilitating role that the assessment report play uh, and also are really willing to be transparent uh, about it. And in turn, we also believe that upon provision of the uh, of the assessment report, this should really um speed up and not slowing down the, the approval process uh, in, in comparison uh, to a standard review. Yes. Thanks, Francesca. And thanks for highlighting this bit on assessment reports. Um, I think just to reiterate what you mentioned, for us as an industry, we are aware about the importance of using assessment reports as a tool to facilitate reliance. So within our um, different working groups at IFPMA, we are actively trying to um, be a solution provider and, and a partner to, to NRA and all to other stakeholders working on this, on how we can actively promote um, the sharing of uh, assessment reports and the use of assessment reports uh, for the purpose of reliance. So it is a topic that's much of a, a priority for us. At, uh, at IFPMA. So let me turn to the uh, Q&A uh, box that we have here. Um, I think one question that it would be very interesting to hear the feedback from uh, a regulator would be this one that I have uh, with uh, three thumbs up on how reliance can be applied first for post-approval changes. So without actually having it for the, the initial submission, if I'm if I understood the question correctly. So how um, or whether is it acceptable or possible to apply PACs first to clear the black the backlog, for example, uh, and clear resources for new uh, marketing authorizations? 
Does any of you have a, an experience in seeing this being um, implemented at national level? And do you think this is uh, best practice uh, actually to, to be done? I don't know, Francesco or Yang Yang, who wants to go first? I can, I can maybe share. Um, so uh, definitely yes, and uh, I would I would reference to my last slide maybe on uh, how reliance uh, uh, we think of reliance as a marriage, but also reliance to um, to be adapted to different uh, uh, situation and uh, the fact that reliance was not used maybe at uh, for at IMA does not um, hinder the uh, possibility to use it for uh, for a post-approval change. On the other hand, it should be something that uh, should be definitely considered to reduce those uh, uh, backlog at the health authority. And again, focusing resources where those are really needed. Um, so we have examples uh, and uh, um, where um, Reliance was not officially implemented, but also in, in my presentation, I show cases of uh, use of reliance, use informal use of reliance. So uh, where it was not present in the regulations, but by leveraging on the uh, approval letter in case, for instance, uh, of a type one B change or type two, or leveraging on the on the assessment report, uh, this uh, uh, was really uh, cutting down significantly the uh, review timelines and allowing uh, uh, reviewers to um, to clear um, a large number of, of submissions that they would not have been able to do otherwise. So uh, something to uh, to really uh, consider even if I am at IMA has not been used. And I don't know if there was another question, Sandro, connected to that. I now have, might have missed it. No, I think that was that was it. You pretty much answered it, Francesca. Would you like to comment, Professor Yan Yan? Or... Uh, yes, and from WHO point of view, in we do not re uh, uh, recommend uh, uh, agency you know, to implement a reliance for all of the product at the moment uh, at once. No, we are encouraging them starting from the uh, the product they they are uh, familiar with. They have the confidence on the quality, safety, efficacy of the product. For example, they can start in with like you know DTP vaccines. Let's like talking about vaccine, or they can start in with the small molecules which have a very much a stable uh, safety profile on the, on the efficacy, and they can start in with you know agencies like uh, EMA or USFDA or other regulatory authority. They are very familiar, and that they know their um, history of uh, regulatory decisions of the agency. They can refer to their decision. They can start from, you know, step by step. Then at the end, they can uh, recognize all of the product and not only on post-approval change, but also on launch release, on marketing authorization, on the GMP inspection report or whatever, you know, those type of regulatory uh, approaches. You know, they can do that as well. Thank you. Thanks. And I see an interesting question here, which um, might be a bit technical. I'm not sure if uh, either of you has a specific answer to this, but um, participants are asking whether health authorities of a lower maturity level, for example, maturity level one, can rely on SRAs for PECs, knowing that there are different, they will have different variation classification systems. Um, or do they need to have the same classification system to be to be able to use reliance? Uh, if I can start, yes, you know, whatever maturity level of you are, you can make the decision. I rely on a particular reference uh, regulatory agencies. That's your decision. It, no matter you know maturity level, either it's one, two, or three, you, know, you are. You can make the decision, and I rely on the decision made by another NRA. That's based on the you know the, the resources in your in your agency. Whether you have uh, enough capacity to review all the data, or you have capacity to understand the science be, uh, behind the data provided, and whatever in the maturity level you can you can do it. That's my primary response. Thank you. 
Thank you. No, thank you very much. I think just the final question to wrap up, because I see it here on the Q&A, um, regarding implementation of ICH Q12. I think it's something that always comes up when we discuss this, of course. Um, and we have one minute, but maybe any final comments from uh, either one of you on this before we, we wrap up? Maybe maybe I can make a start because we, we, we have been received a lot of comments in, from regulatory authorities and from industry as well. Uh, because ICH has been developed the Q12 you know, past a couple of years and has been uh, implemented in some member state of ICH. And it's a really very good document. And the WHO as observer uh, was involved in the development process. I, I, I was one of the uh, observer in the involved in the development of Q12. That's why WHO learned a lot from ICH Q12, and we are now after uh, receive proposals from uh, stakeholders. We are trying to review WHO guideline and uh, learn um, and, and trying to understand how much we can use Q12. Uh, whether the new concept can be borrowed from the QTF guideline, whether that be applicable to, uh, you know, the WHO member state rather than you know, ICH. ICH is only part of you know, the world because we WHO have 194 uh, member states all over the world. And whether those you know, concepts or the principles can be applicable to those countries. That's what will be discussed in the uh, coming future. And we will, we will see you know, how could we, uh, the WHO guideline, the ICH Q12 can be, you know, uh, alignment each other or not. Thank you. Thank you for this feedback and thank you for, for this discussion, uh, Francesca and Yang Yang. We're now getting towards the end of, uh, of our uh, session four. Thank you so much for your contribution. I certainly learned a lot today. I hope our attendees were also able to, to have some uh, takeaways from today's session. I have a quick summary slide from some of the things that I captured from your presentations and also some uh, general um, messages about the post approval changes that I think it would be useful for us to go through just before closing the session. Um, as you, as we've briefly discussed today, there are many challenges that are uh, posed both to regulators and industry. Uh, there are there is a wide variety of regulations on tax around the world, unpredictable timelines for approvals that ultimately lead to duplication of, of efforts and delayed submissions with all the impact that has for uh, patient safety and uh, delivery of medicines and vaccines. There are, of course, international standards, uh, like the ones that were presented today by Dr. Diang Yang uh, from WHO on um, how post-approval changes and the frameworks for post-approval changes can be implemented uh, at a local level. And the use of these international standards are key to harmonizing and converging standards uh, among different countries in the world. And alignment with WHO standards, as we've seen in the previous session on reliance, will be the ultimate uh, driver uh, to facilitate reliance. We talked a lot about also risk-based approaches and what does, what does that mean for post-approval changes and how a risk-based classification of changes is essential to be able to have a post-approval changes management as highlighted in ICH Q12 and WHO's guidelines. Uh, talking more specifically about the use of reliance for PACs, um, again, highlighting that reliance is a tool that can be useful throughout the entire life cycle of a medicine or a vaccine. And as usual with reliance, the responsibility of the final regulatory decision on the approval of PAC still lies with the receiving NRA. And to end on this uh, note that was just mentioned by Francesca uh, at the panel, transparent communication is really key for us to drive this and other conversation forward between industry and regulators. And I think it's 
discussions and moments like the one we had today that can really facilitate driving this forward. And with that, we're getting towards the end of day two of the Africa Regulatory Conference. I have added here in my last slide some publications from IFDMA on post-approval changes. You have um, both the link and the QR code for you to, to be able to scan it uh, right now in case you want. Otherwise, this will be made available on our conference website as soon as the conference is uh, over. So thank you very much, everyone, for staying until the, the very end. Just as a reminder, tomorrow we still have um, day three of Africa Regulatory Conference, where we'll be discussing how Africa, how can Africa pioneer regulatory system innovation and digitalization. You can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Thank you, everyone, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.